The soft clucking of the hens and languid barks of dogs fill the dark until an unnatural silence descends like a weight upon the air. A lonely, ululating howl pierces the night, unlike any dog or wolf ever heard, but something far more primal and frightening. People huddle in their beds, the few outside their homes rushing to safety, making the sign of the cross, fearing the approach of the beast. A creature roams the night, scenting prey, unable to stop itself from attacking the vulnerable. A man by day, a monster by the light of the moon. Have you ever heard the dark, tragic story of the seventh sun? Or ever wondered how widespread stories of supernatural creatures really are? Or perhaps you've wondered about the dark realities that feed the legends. If so, bienvenidos and welcome to another episode of Weird Latinx Podcast. My name is Allie Miles, and I want to take you on a strange journey through things that go bump in the noche. The paranormal, urban legends, supernatural phenomena, true crime, and other weirdness from Latin America and the Latinx diaspora. Don't worry if you don't know Spanish or Portuguese. I'm here to dive into the research and curate the scariest and strangest tales you have probably never heard. But don't think that just because you haven't heard them before, they won't, they won't haunt, you. haunt you. Our second story comes from South America, from three countries to be precise. Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Disfruten, curse, of the Lobison. Enjoy. El viento suena lamento por los pagos del sanjón, pues se cuenta que un paisano Puestero de la armonía, que séptimo hijo varón. Ojeroso, clinas largas, hasta solo suele hablar. Y no hay paye que le entre. The wind sounds its laments through the towns of the ravine, because they say a neighbor, a stall vendor in armonía, is a seventh son. Haggard, with long wild hair, he even talks to himself. There is no talisman that will harm him, not from the old women of the town. When you hear the dogs howl, finish up your prayers. There's fear among the neighbors of the town in the ravine, since they all believe the stall vendor turns into a lobison. Imagine a clear spring night, a full moon shining down on a small rural town, casting its glow over the surrounding fields and wreathing the tangled woods around it in shadows as the townspeople rest after a full day of work. On Chaco Street, a horse trots across the dirt road to feed on the grass outside the local cemetery, Cemeterio Rosario del Tala, its lead trailing on the ground beside it. Along Dr. Rosada Street, right by the basketball court, where the paved portion of the road begins, a few people pass on their bicycles, heading to their homes at the edge of town. They pass by the black gates of the cemetery, with the two stone angels flanking the entrance. The gates are closed at night, but dogs and other animals roam the graveyard, where only makeshift fencing and shrubs form a barrier a quarter of the way around it. On two sides of the graveyard sit small houses, and behind it, fields and farms and woods for miles. Rosario del Tala is a place like many others in Entre Rios province, Argentina, and this 
is the setting for our first case. In October 2007, the chief of police in Rosario del Tala, Bernardo Sibulovsky, confirmed that he was called upon by citizens in Tala to investigate a, quote, type of hairy four-legged animal that walks upright on two legs. Precisely because so many neighbors complained and stated that they too had seen this strange upright walking lobison, Chief Sibulovsky said he was moved to take action and investigate. He explained, quote, According to interviews collected, this animal is of considerable height, similar to that of a horse, end quote. He continued, Up to now, there has been no violent or extreme situation in which this animal has appeared. End quote. Townspeople reported that this creature was only seen at night and ran in a bizarre manner, with some witnessing it running bipedally, and others claiming that it scuttled on four legs. It was seen near Rosario del Tala Cemetery, and everyone in town knows that's where the Lobison lurks. This wasn't just idle gossip or neighbors posting on social media. There were over 4,000 people who reported seeing this beast out of a town of nearly 13,000. This news was reported on Radio La Voz, 90.1 FM, and through the news outlet Análisis in Entre Rios. The police were actively investigating what was commonly thought of as a myth or old wives' tale. Sounds like a scene from a werewolf movie. But the monster in this one is not your usual lycanthrope. A werewolf transformed by the cursed bite of another. It's not directly tied to European stories of Germanic Werwolf, Norse berserkers, or Portuguese Lobisomem, or Wolfman. But it is a monster whose story is birthed contemporaneously in South America. Some indigenous Americans already believed in the jaguar man, Yawarete Aba. Its fusion was only natural as the cultures met and melded, their nightmares combining. The creature reported in Rosario del Tala is unique to this area of South America cursed by its very birth to travel the worlds between life and death. It consumes the living and the dead and steals the souls of those who cross its path. This beast is the terrifying Lobison. Guillermo Lockhart Uruguayan host of Voces Anonymas, or Anonymous Voices, a paranormal TV show, sets the scene for this story perfectly in his episode, Aullido del Viernes, or Howl on Friday. El siete es un número mágico y místico the number seven is a magical, mystical number that has a lot of symbolism and is always present in our lives, more than we imagine. Seven are the days of the week, the colors in a rainbow, the musical notes. We have seven deadly sins. In the Bible, seven is the perfect number, but in mythology, this number is linked to a curse. That of the seventh son, or Lobison. The Lobison has many names, called Luison, Luiso, or Huicho. His tail spans areas all around the Gran Chaco, the large lowland plain in central South America. Although Gran Chaco now has a multitude of cultures, from European to Quechua, Guarani has been the most important and influential there, with a very rich mythology. The Guarani are a group of indigenous South Americans located in what is now Paraguay, 
northern Argentina, and eastern Bolivia, and southeast Brazil. In Guarani lore, an ancient tale is told about the spirit of evil, Tau, who fell in love with a beautiful mortal maiden, Kerana, the daughter of the chief Marangatu. Kerana was so lovely that everyone who saw her fell head over heels in love. But she had the strange custom of sleeping throughout the day and waking at night. When Tau saw her, his desire knew no bounds. He transformed into a handsome youth to better court her. He appeared to her seven nights in a row, each time whispering words of love and flattery, wooing her. Then, on the seventh evening, when she had been lulled by his professions of love, he saw his chance and tried to kidnap her. Angatupiri, the spirit of good, saw what was happening and rushed to the rescue. Challenging Tau, he fought him for seven days in a tightly contested battle until Angatupiri finally won. Tau was furious, and even as he was exiled by Pitayobai, the god of war and valor, he stole into Kerana's village and kidnapped her. The mother goddess of the sky, Arasi, was so angered that she cursed Tau, ensuring that all of his children would be monsters. <laughs> this, of course, seriously sucked for Kerana, because she sure as hell didn't go willingly, and this meant she was cursed to bear these demon children. Tau and Kerana went on to have seven beastly children, born prematurely at seven months, each one vying to be the worst abomination for the Warani. Every son is a creature that is still talked about in parts of Latin America. The first is the Jujawa, an alligator with a dog's head. Then comes Mboi Tui, an enormous snake with a parrot's beak. Monyai is the third, another huge snake with gigantic straight horns on its head. After him comes Yasi Yatere, a small golden-haired mischief maker whose elvish looks and pranks hide his monstrous behavior, <laughs> particularly stealing children and feeding them to his sixth brother, Ao Ao. Kirana's fifth son, Kurupi, is a small muscular man with a fantastically elongated penis, which he wears wrapped around his waist. This monster uses his member to catch his prey, women and children, who he then rapes and kills. Then came the youngest child born to Tau and Kerana, Luison or Lobison. When he was born, Lobison was a grotesque half-dog, half-man, with long, filthy hair covering parts of its pallid, emaciated body. Looking half-starved, the creature's bones poked out from under the skin, from the ribs in its barrel chest, to the hip bones in its flaccid haunches, as it walked alternately on two or four feet. It reeked of death and decay. A huge fang-filled mouth, a horrible mixture of human and dog, would stretch and let out its fearful howl when it hunted. Its pale human eyes lit up like red hot coals when it found prey, feasting on human remains excrement, or the vulnerable living. As a living creature, its preference for rotting human flesh drove it to desecrate burial sites, often roaming graveyards, always among the dead. But if a mortal crossed paths with this deadly beast, 
even if he or she escaped with their life, Lobison would take their immortal soul. Seven stars appeared in the heavens when Lobison was born, signaling that he was the last of the cursed children. This was the constellation that we now know as the Pleiades. Arasi's wrath had been slaked. But Tau and Gerana's children rampaged the earth for years, destroying human lives until they were trapped by a brave young woman, Borasi, who sacrificed herself for her people and sealed herself in a cave with all seven where they were burned. Her story is fascinating and worth a read if you want to discover more Guarani tales. Further reading is listed in the episode notes. But back to our Lobison. The creature's reign over humans was over, and they could not walk the land of the living with impunity as they had before. Each monster kept to the shadows, while the wise women and other elders warned their people. Lobison, in particular, was not vanquished, because his curse then lived on in humans. Just as Thau's courtship of Gerana had lasted seven days, so had his fight with Angatupiri. His seven offspring were all born in the seventh month. Seven stars had shone upon the Lobison's birth. As Guillermo Lockhart said, the mystical number seven lives on in the fates of humans. The seventh son of a family of all boys is destined to become a Lobison. Females were also not immune to this curse. The seventh daughter in a succession of all girls will become a witch. que dan los brillos en noches claras de luna violines desafinados mosquitada en la laguna un agorero chistido que del monte traen los vientos la lechuza nos anuncia oscuros presentimientos la luna toca su cuerpo the moon touches his skin Naked, he rolls around, and transformed he leaves, shaking his skeleton, like a terrible messenger, he roams fields and ranches, the Lobison wanders, smelling sulfurous and rancid. In July of 2010, the newspaper El Territorio reported a strange case in the village of Los Elechos in Misiones Province, Argentina. A 29-year-old engineering student was found naked and disoriented on a farm in the village. He did not recall why he had made his way to the farm, nor how he had traversed the 12 kilometers, or 24 miles, from his apartment in Oberá. In addition, 20 dead chickens were found on the farm that morning, and the two aggressive farm dogs, a large Dogo Argentino and Rottweiler, refused to approach the man and even avoided the outdoor latrine where the man had been for several hours. A neighbor, Paulino, said the following. Everything is too much coincidence. The dead chickens, the fierce dogs that did nothing, and to top it off, it was a full moon. Out there in the cities, they don't believe in the Lobison, but out on the farms, 
a lot of people have seen this for many years. Originally, the owner of the farm, Mario McDonald, thought he had been robbed. He had arrived at 3 p.m. on Sunday to find that wooden slats had been ripped off the barn. The chicken coop was open, and the two dogs were running loose when they had been collared and chained. Originally, he thought they had been the culprits of the carnage with the hens, but could find no sign that they had been the attackers, and nothing was stolen from the vandalized barn. It wasn't until three hours later that Mr. McDonald found the naked man kneeling in the pit dug for the latrine and his clothes nearby. McDonald called the police, who took the man into custody, and then to Samick Hospital to get first aid. Although initially in shock, he was identified as Marcelo Freiberger and later released that night to the care of his family. The next day, under police questioning, he repeated that he did not remember anything, except that early on Saturday he had left his apartment and walked a long way. Mr. McDonald was very perplexed by these events. It was incredible that the dogs had no collar on, and the man didn't even have a scratch on him. His guard dogs were so fierce that sometimes workers on the farm had trouble approaching the dogs but they slunk away in fear of the intruder on the farm. To anyone familiar with the legends, that the dogs were cowed by a strange man served as further confirmation that on the night of the full moon, Los Helechos had been visited by a lobison. My love is a lobison, a big hairy beast. The people of Los Helechos knew what to look for in a suspected lobison, as did everyone in Gran Chaco. In fact, most of the people in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Brazil know what the signs are. So, how do you spot a lobison? The first and most obvious characteristic of a lobison is its birth order. The seventh son in a contiguous line of all boys. Upon reaching adolescence, usually at age 13, its first transformation occurs. This predetermination that the seventh son would turn into a deadly monster by his 13th birthday was not just an idle superstition, Throughout the Gran Chaco region, people truly believed in the curse, especially as European and Quechua cultures intermingled with the Guarani beliefs. Many families would abandon or even kill their seventh-born sons or daughters, fearing they would become lobisones or brujas. Attempts were made to mitigate the curse, some saying that a seventh son could be baptized in seven distinct churches, given the name Benito, or bendito, meaning blessed, and with the eldest brother serving as his godfather, he could escape the malediction. Borrowing from European custom, as seen in the 19th and early 20th century Russia, Germany, and Belgium, where the Tsar, or king, would become godfather to the seventh son, immigrants brought this belief into the fold of Lobison lore as well. They believed that having the country's ruler would combat the curse of their birth. In 1907, two Volga German immigrants asked Argentine President José Figueroa Alcorta to be the godfather to their seventh son. He acceded, and this practice continued unofficially. 
It was then published as a presidential decree in March of 1973 by President Juan Domingo Perón with Decree 848, the law of presidential godfathering. After his death, the new president, his wife, Isabel Perón, cemented it into law in September 1974. This, it was hoped, would save seventh-born children from death and abandonment. This law is still followed and makes headlines. In 2014, President Cristina Fernández de Kirchner became godmother to a seventh son. And in November 2019, President Mauricio Macri became godfather to another. Regardless of the gender of the president or the seventh child, Many godchildren have been awarded this distinction throughout Argentine history. In fact, former President Macri has 45 godchildren. 36 are Catholic, 7 evangelical, and 2 are Jewish. The last one occurring on his birthday, February 8, 2019. Current Argentine President Alberto Fernández became godfather to a seventh daughter in February of 2020. As you see, the practice continues. In Paraguay, the practice began in 1919 with President Irigoyen, and during the Stroessner dictatorship, Alfredo Stroessner was godfather to almost 30,000 seventh children. He was in power for a regrettably long 35 years. You'll hear more about him in other tales. But when democracy returned to Paraguay in 1983, the practice was continued with male and female presidents. In 2010 in Argentina, a particular case about these practices was in the news. Former Argentine dictator Jorge Rafael Videla was the godfather to a seventh son, Gaston Castillo, who made an appeal to the Catholic Church with his lawyer. Under Videla's rule, Casillo's father was kidnapped and disappeared while his mother was pregnant with him, her seventh son. When he was born in 1977, she appealed to have the presidential godfathering in the hope of finding out where her husband was, but to no avail. Gaston Casillo's father's body was discovered in 2009 buried in a shallow grave with the marker no name and indications that he had been murdered. Castillo had to go to court to have the monster responsible for his father's disappearance and death removed from his ecclesiastical life. For some people, it doesn't take lunar transformation to turn them into monsters. Although the stories of El Obison trace back much farther than the 1900s, with one of the earliest tales written down in 1877, some say that the resurgence in Lobison lore came after the Chaco War, a conflict between Paraguay and Bolivia that lasted from 1932 to 1935. By the end of this bloody war, over 100,000 men had died on both sides and many were wounded and disappeared. The casualties were so high that the bodies were left where they fell, and soldiers were unable to bury their dead in the rough, semi-arid terrain, especially as malnourished and sick as they were. At night, they heard and saw the wild dogs feasting on the bodies of their comrades. Most of them were dead, but some soldiers were wounded and still alive as the packs attacked and fed. Is it any wonder that many soldiers came back from the war with stories of the Luison or Lobison, the half man, half canine? A horrible creature, just like the old wives' tales that consumed cadavers and the most vulnerable the wounded. 
These stories were then told in rural and urban areas, passed on from father to son and mother to daughter. Someone always seems to know someone else, a friend or family member, who has had an encounter with a lobison. And some people actually have their own personal tales. On March 29th, in 2011, Enrique Stefans, a young tire serviceman who worked in Oro Verde, a neighborhood in the city of Paraná, was heading back home to Aldea Brasilera, Brasilera Village, along Route 11, an approximately 20 kilometer or 12 and a half mile drive. He was interviewed on TV by El Once Paraná News, and this is what happened to him in his own words. It was nine o'clock, maybe a quarter to nine. I was on my motorcycle and I was by the edge of town heading into Ensayo, in the curve, the dip, and I look, I put the high beams on and I saw it running, but it comes running strongly out of the overgrowth. I mean, I know the route, but from the right fright I got, I ducked down. I thought it was going to run me down. And it must have been two meters, two meters ninety, approximately six and a half to nine and a half feet tall. That thing I saw, the head was kind of big. This town, Aldea Brasilera, just south of the Paraná River, had a small population of just over a thousand people in the early 2000s, including the nearby countryside. It's a district scattered with farms and brush, small ranches and groves of trees. And at night, plenty of dark spaces where all manner of creatures lurk. The interviewer continues asking Stephens, how did you feel after that, on your way home? And he responds. I felt very afraid. The first thing I did was gun my motorcycle. I thought something was going to happen, so I got out of there fast. At that moment, I didn't think anything. I just gunned the bike and went to tell my family at home and tell the police what had happened. The police were great. They went out right away, but they didn't find anything. She continues the interview, asking, were you able to sleep last night? And Stephens continues. I slept maybe a couple of hours. I felt shaky, afraid, a feeling that something was going to happen. The news outlet, El Entre Rios, later interviewed him, and he added, I was very afraid. A guy in Concordia had told me he had come back from fishing and also saw this animal in the same place. But it was still. I took it as a joke. But what I saw was astounding. As far as I'm concerned, it's a wolfman, or lobison, like the legends say. Another sure sign of a lobison is the timing of the change. The curse inflicts transformation on Fridays and sometimes on Tuesdays. It takes place at dusk or midnight until the next dawn. Some say lobisons transform only on those nights when the moon is full, whereas others believe the moon has no bearing on the curse. It is said that when the lobison nears the change, he feels strange, overcome with the desire to separate himself from other people, to find a remote and private area. He goes to the hills or fields, and in the city to abandoned areas. 
unable to understand the need. He removes all his clothes, and once naked, rolls around on the ground from right to left. As he rides, he begins to recite the Apostles' Creed backwards. That act, a blasphemy so foul, it cements his curse. The story is told in the country, my friend, with huge respect for the transformation, about a man who turns into a big dog, calf, or yaguabicho. Listen to my song. The seventh son that I've hired, on Friday nights he becomes Lobison. The dogs howl and avoid him and no bullet can harm him. His tongue's like a black charred stick. And when it's dawn, mm-hmm, Yaguabicho or Lobison, the spell is gone. He's a man again. The story remains, told in Chamamé. Listen to it now. I will sing to you. A third sign of the Lobison curse is appearance. In human shape, the Lobison is tall, thin, hairy, and oftentimes sickly. <coughs> he is very often antisocial and solitary. Foul smelling, he reeks a rancid mix of sulfur and rot do the, all the excrement, carrion, and dug up dead he eats when transformed. There's a well-known saying in Gran Chaco, Cuando el gallinero está limpio, el lobizón anda acechando. When the hen house is clean, the lobizón is stalking. The lobizón doesn't just eat chicken feces, but that of other animals. Makes you think twice about that young man in the latrine pit, doesn't it? Additionally, with a gross hangover of poop, rot, and blood, the Lobison shows the effects of his rampage the day after transformation, with belly aches, cuts and scrapes, bruises and contusions, as well as intense Hence, lethargy. Add to that diet unbaptized babies, its favorite food, and you can imagine the stomach aches. On September 29, 2019, an article appeared in El Litoral, an Argentinian newspaper. Earlier, in September 14, 2008, the same story had appeared in Diario Popular and Misiones Online. Ramon Martinez, a 73-year-old Buenos Aires man, spoke about the unspoken secret of the small town of his birth, Santa Inés. Although he had left the town as a teenager, he remembered that everyone spoke of tall and thin Don Santos Luna, or Don Pancho, as he was affectionately known, and his life as a lobison. Yes, Santos Luna, literally Saint Moon. Martinez is quoted saying, it was normal for the whole town that he lived there. We all knew he was a lobison, and he knew that we all knew about his problem. That's because no one was afraid of him. On the contrary, we respected him tremendously. He was a proper, educated, and hard-working person. What he had was not seen 
as a supernatural or demonic phenomenon. Rather a problem in his life. Something that had no cure. I'm allowing myself to break the pact of silence we had as a town because so many years have passed and his memory deserves it. Martinez lived 200 meters from Don Pancho's business, a little neighborhood store that carried food and tools, and the town's parents did not fear their neighbor, actually sending the youngsters to the store at all times to get sundries. Everyone knew that Thursdays, Don Pancho had a ritual. Around 5 p.m. he closed his shop and disappeared, only returning to reopen again at 8.30 the next morning. Sometimes he returned with scratches, bruises, bandages, or even noticeable difficulties walking. But no one mentioned it out of respect. Everyone knew that he had left the town before his transformation so as not to perturb his neighbors and friends. And so they returned the favor by being discreet. On May 23rd, 2014, El Territorio, the newspaper of Misiones region, covering the town of Cien Hectarias, reported a number of people who heard the howling of a lobison the week before, during the time of the full moon. Many also reported seeing a gruesome, hairy creature walking on two legs. A woman in the neighborhood said that some chickens from her coop had disappeared, and others saw this creature jumping over the walls of neighboring houses. Domingo Paniagua, the president of the neighborhood commission, said, quote, They always said that in the barrio we had a lobison. I've been here 30 years. There's lots of talk, and one neighbor in particular has been named as the one who transforms. But I never saw anything. Many neighbors believe in the lobison, and they say they saw it in the patios and jumping the walls. End quote. Chief Commissioner Celso Gasano of the Second Regional Police Unit commented that two people had reported the same to him. This was not the only time something strange had happened in this town. Back in 2010, a possible lobison was found on a ranch there. Remember the naked student? That happened here. The appearance of the transformed Lobison is also characteristic. He looks like his legendary progenitor, a mix of dog and man, with large ears and dark brown or black fur. It's color depending on the hue of his skin when human. The grotesque mix of human and canine continues in its dog-like body and fang-filled muzzle. Occasionally, some people see a wolf man, though most report seeing a large, odd dog, or even a disturbing mix of pig and dog. This is why some footage in Paraguay captured public attention. Since it was a black and white security cam, there was no sound, but the recording that begins at 9.59 p.m. is creepy AF. <gasps> On January 7, 2007, in Ipacaraí, Paraguay, the camera recorded an empty street. A solitary dog, a shepherd mix, watches a jogger approach, emerging from the shadows into the light of a street lamp in the middle of a tree-lined street. As the man gets closer, the dog runs at him, barking aggressively and wagging its tail, trying to chase the man off. The jogger is visibly upset, and after raising his hands to ward off the dog's attack, starts gesticulating and shooing the dog away. He stoops to pick up some rocks and continues on his way, obviously shouting at the dog, who barks some more as the man exits from view. 
almost a minute later. A car crosses the intersection where the jogger had come from, narrowly missing two dog-like figures, one black, one white, in the road. The lighter dog bounds away from the darker one, darting back and forth around it until the black dog emerges alone from the shadows, slinking along the road. Larger than either of the dogs on film, with a large barrel chest, long legs, and an emaciated, starved-looking body, the black dog approaches the first dog, who waits and wags its tail submissively. The black dog stills as the shepherd sniffs him, and then resumes its languid walk while the submissive shepherd backs away. Could this simply be a recording of stray dogs roaming the street? Sure, but it's the demeanor, the size, and the walk that make the large black dog so eerie. Coupled with the aggressive first dog's sudden submissiveness when the supposed lobison has absolutely no reaction. It sends chills down your spine. And there are two different camera views of these actions, two separate security cameras. The large black dog even ignores a moving car. The link to the video is in the episode notes as well. I looked through scores of videos tracking down the fakes, the guys in wolf suits, the multiple bogus claims for the same video, and the FX footage from a low-budget movie used to claim they found a lobison in mid-transformation. This one seems innocuous. Until you watch closely. Judge for yourself. On November 7th, 2011, Daniel Carvalho filed a complaint at the Punta Alta police station in Guarapá, Mission Province, a town just across the Paraná River from Paraguay, about an animal that was seen roaming in his neighborhood. The 22-year-old construction worker said the following, quote, that creature doesn't let me sleep. Every night it screams outside my window. The truth is that it's a frightening howl that shakes you up leaves you deaf. The first time that I saw it, it was in my yard, fighting with my dog. I actually had it by the neck, and since I thought it was a normal dog, I told it to let go. Then I really saw it. It was very robust, about 90 kilos, 198 pounds, and looks a lot like a Siberian Husky, but with red eyes." End quote. Although Carvalho claimed that he didn't believe it was a lobison, he reported it to the police because he was afraid it would attack his unbaptized three-month-old child. Remember that from lobison lore? Or other children in the neighborhood. He said that he preferred to think of the creature that he had seen for the last three months as a large dog or cougar. His neighbors said it wasn't possible since the beast was huge, black, and hairy. Not cream colored like a cougar. Noted veterinarian Miguel Angel Rios, the director of the Puma Ecological Park, said that he did not think it could be an Aguarawasu, a creature often confused with a lobison because it stays away from populated areas. He conceded that this canid could be pushed out of its territory and it could have ended up in Guarapá. It wouldn't be the first time an Aguarawasu was mistaken for a lobison. The maned wolf, or Aguarawasu in Guarani, is the only species of the genus Chrysoceon 
And while it looks like a fox on steroids, it is neither a fox nor a wolf. It has the reddish coat coloration of a fox with a light tipped tail and large fox-like ears, but has a furry black mane and long black legs. We have pictures on our website, Weird Latinx, if you'd like to see what they look like. They are solitary and do not form packs, hunting for small prey animals and foraging for fruit. Native to the grassland areas of Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, and Bolivia, precisely the areas where the lobison comes from. It is believed that habitat loss chased them out of Uruguay, and they are currently near threatened as a species. Argentina had some pivotal sightings of these canids recently. In March 2019, two Aguaraguasu were filmed in Corrientes province. Then, in May 2019, in the town of La Eduvigis, Chaco province, an injured Aguaraguasu was found, and after veterinary care, it was released back into the wild. These unique creatures could very easily confuse a person in the dark, and any encounter with them would be potentially frightening. And if you heard this, it might give you chills too. Fernando Peralta, a zoologist in the Buenos Aires Zoo, believes that an aguaraguasu could be mistaken for a lobison quite easily. In season one, episode six of Destination Truth, a paranormal investigation show on Sci-Fi Channel. The host, Josh Gates, travels to San Ignacio in the north of Argentina to investigate the stories of the Lobison. When Peralta shows him the unusual animal, Gates agrees it could be the inspiration for the Lobison stories. Witnesses interviewed in the small town state that they have seen a large dog-like creature with red eyes that chilled them to the bone. One man tells Gates he has a Lobison's DNA, having caught one outside his house. He claims to have strung up the beast and whipped it before it got away. Gates buys the whip to test for DNA. You can take a look at the episode, which includes an overnight stay to see if a young seventh son will transform. But beware the awful condescension Gates displays towards the child he's observing. Spoiler here, he takes the whip to Dr. Terry Kuhn at UC Davis, who performs tests on it and declares that the DNA is 100% human. It was not an aguaraguasu, not a wolf or a dog that was tied up or struck with the whip. Human DNA. With weeds, a little witch made a concoction transforming a little gaucho into a terrible lobison. It's a full moon and a howl was heard. The young ladies all shook with fear because the lobison is coming. He'll eat you, he'll eat you. The lobison will eat you. He'll grab you, he'll hug you. The lobison will destroy you. November 10th, 2017. A group of three firefighters were battling a brush fire just off of kilometer 1084 on Route 12 near Ramada Paso in Corrientes Province, Argentina. The group had left from Itati on the banks of the Paraná River where the closest fire station was located, 15 kilometers or about nine miles away. 
They arrived and began fighting the fire at around 5.30 p.m., starting closest to a small house among the fields and ranches, working to keep the flames away from the home. Once the fire there was contained, they moved farther away toward an area that was filled with trees, dry brush, and fields. At about 7 p.m., they were moving further into a second field, about a kilometer away from the road, passing by a grove of eucalyptus trees, when they saw something that froze them in their tracks. Y bueno, ahí, eh, cuando estaban apagando ahí las chicas, lo que hacen es cuando giran la mirada, ven como un... Digamos, well, un there they were. When the girls were putting out the fire, what they did was, when they turned, they saw like a, let's say a dog standing, let's say uh, the size of a human. That was what called their attention. This recording is from LT7, Radio Provincia de Corrientes, Corrientes Province Radio, 900 AM, a local radio station. The host interviewed Ricardo Rojas, the fire chief for the Itati volunteer firefighters, who continued to give her information about that night. The firefighters radioed in and were able to connect with Chief Rojas, who was working a shift at the hospital that night. He called in reinforcements heading out their way as well. He told his crew in Ramada Paso that if the fire did not threaten the house nearby, and if they felt threatened or in danger, to rush back to the fire truck. Chief Rojas arrived by 8 p.m. and all the firefighters put out the last of the fire. Were the firefighters shocked? The host asks. Chief Rojas replies, yes, because it surprised me that two of my partners, and we say partners because we are all colleagues, male and female, um, they stayed in the truck, right there on the route. And the rest, one of the girls, went in with us to show us the place. But although they looked for over two hours, they could not find any trace of a large dog-like creature. Chief Rojas says he can't just discount the firefighter's sighting, especially since he's seen strange things himself. He has been a fire chief in rural Corrientes province for 19 years. He tells the host of LT7 that kilometer 1084 of Route 12 has a history of strange things, of accidents and tragedies. Even a family that crashed into a tree and was killed by a swarm of wasps that attacked them while they were already injured. Strange things indeed. Reiterating what the firefighters saw, the host points out that the creature's appearance occurred during the full moon. She also agrees that it is hard to dismiss the creature's sighting. It wasn't just a pair of eyes that saw it, but three people. Yes. Three people, Rojas agrees. Once you think you've encountered a lobison, the question of what to do about it arises. Do you, like the town of San Ignacio, let the suspected lobison be, believing the curse is simply a weakly indisposition? Or do you seek to chase the creature and scare it away or even end its life? This is not an easy thing to do. Tales say a lobison can be called by his human name, but once discovered, he will seek revenge. And he cannot be wounded easily if he attacks a human, since most bullets and knives don't pierce its hide. Most old tales recommend that you kill a lobison rather than just injure it, 
using a knife with a cross-shaped hilt. As long as it has been blessed. Or a silver bullet. Also blessed. You can even chase him away by shining a flashlight with... You guessed it. Blessed batteries. If he is wounded, the Lobison will transform back into a human when exposed to his own blood. But wounding a Lobison is very dangerous, since he will relentlessly pursue the one who attacked him until he or she is dead. And be careful of chasing a Lobison. If it runs between the legs of a person, their curse is passed on to that victim, and they are forever freed. July 28, 2014. Jorge, a 16-year-old boy in the city of San Justo, Santa Fe, a central eastern province of Argentina, claimed he had seen a lobison when he was returning home at 5 a.m. from a friend's house. He was on the corner of Milesi and 9th of July streets when a large, black, long-tailed animal with red eyes leapt in front of him. The creature smelled foul and began to chase Jorge as he pedaled away furiously on his bike. The animal gained on him, and as his luck would have it, his pedaling knocked the bicycle chain off the gear, and Jorge had to get off the bike. He threw it at the advancing animal and rushed to his house to tell his father the account. This was later disseminated through San Justo Noticias and Cadena Siete, the local newspaper and TV station. Although many laughed at this story, many town elders believed it was a real account of a lobison, assuring that there has always been one in San Justo. But there is a doubt with this story since it occurred on a Monday morning, and the Lobison transforms Friday nights, and sometimes Tuesday nights. In case you hadn't noticed, stories of the Lobison have found their way into popular culture through poems, songs, and movies. Some of the most famous songs have come from provinces like Formosa in the Upper Northeast to Entre Rios near Buenos Aires. One of the most popular genres of music that present the lobison is chamamé, the traditional music of Northeast Argentina. It is a mix of German, Guarani, and Spanish music, a polka played on guitar and accordion. And it's also popular in Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Chilean Patagonia as well. Some of the songs included in this podcast have been prime examples of chamamé. Pop songs about the lobison have also been hits. If you'd like to see slightly different takes on Luison or lobison, I recommend watching Paraguay's Sombras en la Noche, a paranormal TV show. Some of the stories include extensive Guarani, so subtitles are helpful if you're not fluent. Uruguay's Voces Anónimas with Guillermo Lockhart is also great viewing or listening. And you can also find Argentina's biggest nationally produced box office hit, Nazareno Cruz y el Lobo, Nazareno Cruz and the Wolf, directed by Leonardo Fabio. And if you'd like to find something in English, it doesn't exactly fit with the mold. There is the episode Cry Luison from the series Grimm. 
Look in the episode notes for the songs, shows, and artists if you would like to explore them on your own. The reach of the Lobison's tail, pun intended, is larger than you might think. Ultimately, believing a Lobison tail will depend on your degree of skepticism. Does this creature really exist? So many of the videos online are hoaxes, photo manipulations, bad attributions. Like when someone uses footage from a lesser known film or show and it passes through multiple viewers, ending up as a viral video, its inception so far removed from its current use. An example is a current supposed photograph of a lobison in Santa Fe. It's really a photoshopped image of Professor Lupin from the Harry Potter film series in his werewolf state. The possible authenticity of these stories comes from the interviews, the history, and some truly unnerving videos that I can't completely explain you may come to a different conclusion. But as for me, I'll keep the spine tingle and the chicken skin. Thank you very much. Thank you again for spending your time with us at Weird Latinx Podcast. We hope you liked our investigation into this South American cryptid, the Lobison, or Luison. We looked for interviews, articles, videos, and stories, trying to check the veracity of this well-known creature. We pride ourselves on giving you not just the strange, but the story behind it. In the podcast notes are links to the resources in English, Spanish, and Guarani if you would like to follow up. Many thanks to Voces Anonymas with Guillermo Lockhart and Sombras en la Noche from Paraguay for the great Lobison episodes. You can find both on YouTube. The music can all be found in the podcast links on our site. And don't forget, if you or someone you know has experienced an unexplainable event, that you'd like us to share on Weird Latinx Podcast, or know any tales that you would like us to cover, please send us an email at weirdlatinx at gmail.com or drop us a comment at weirdlatinx.com. We have a nifty comment box just for that purpose. Or you can find us on Twitter at weirdlatinx. Keep listening for more episodes about things that go bump in the noche. And subscribe via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. More streams coming soon. This again is Allie Miles wishing you a good night and spooky sueños. <laughs> <laughs>